So Dr. Garrett Barter is a senior wind engineer at the National Renew Renewable Energy Lab, where he leads the development team uh, building tools on top of OpenMDO, so at that, what we would call the library layer, I guess, uh, called WISDOM. I don't know what WISDOM stands for. We'll get to that. Okay. Yes, <laughs> um, despite me not knowing what the acronym stands for, I've had the pleasure of working with the NREL team on the development of WISDOM, or at least consulting with them, uh, since back in the OpenMDO V0 <laughs> days. They were one of the very first, if not the very first, external groups to pick up OpenMDAO. I'm not sure if they regret that or not. <laughs> we'll get to that. We'll too. find out, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. But regardless of whether they regret it, I think the, the die has been cast and they're stuck with it. Um, they've, they've consistently been on what I would consider the cutting edge of OpenMDAO users, so a lot of you have uh, a lot of their suffering to thank for the somewhat smoother experience you've had. Um, but I think to borrow his own words, there have been some growing pains, which I'm excited to hear about. You say that now, but <laughs> right. All right, so, so thanks everyone for your attention. Um, I do realize I stand between you and lunch, um, <laughs> but uh, I, I do think uh, this will be a good conversation. Uh, I would just prepare yourselves that some of my statements may be provocative and that's intentional because this is a small group and it's better to get it out here. Um, so uh, I'm Garrett Barter, I sit at NRL, this is one of the DOE national labs, uh, focused on renewable energy, for those of you not familiar with NRL. We, uh, Catherine Dykes and Andrew Ning, who's in the audience, really started Wisdom, um, but they have now moved on to other places. So Catherine is at DTU, the Danish Technical University, I'm at NRL, a Andrew's at BYU, and together we write this core set of software which we use internally for our own research, but really we're also writing it for other people. This is stuff we put out there on GitHub, it's open source. There are obviously other wind researchers out there using OpenMDO. Um, I know a couple here just from papers. I'm sure there are others out there. If you're on a list, if, if you're using OpenMDO and you're working in, in wind power and your icon isn't up there, I apologize. Um, I would say so um, the people on the, on the roster here on the author list is myself, a couple uh, NREL collaborators, Pietro and Evan, and Catherine, who's now at, uh, at DTU. So I collected their input for this, for this presentation. Um, Professor Andrew Ning is here in the audience. I didn't presume to know your comments, so I'll let you speak up for, for your own self. Um, and, and he was really one of the, the probably first adopter uh, at NREL, him and Catherine. So just to give you some context of what we're talking about, I know this is probably mostly an aerospace community. Um, a lot of us in wind had our uh, origins in aerospace, myself included. Uh, but NREL, one of the ways we contribute back to the wind community, both industry and academia, is through our software. We have a, a range of software products that we open uh, to the community. A flagship one is OpenFast. This is kind of a, a medium fidelity engineering models, legacy, a lot of, lots of legacy Fortran code there. Uh, but that's what most of industry knows when they think of NREL software. There's Wisdom, this is what we'll talk about today, Wind Plant Integrated System Design and Engineering Model. And then we have some plant level modeling that I think um, Andrew Ning is gonna talk about. These kind of span the range of fidelity levels, uh, kind of uh, from lowest florist to, you know, uh, large eddy simulation CFD of NALU. And Floris also has a back and forth relationship with OpenMDO. I won't get into that here. I don't know, maybe Andrew will, but um, I don't need to belabor uh, why MDO and systems engineering is important to, to the people in this audience, that's for sure. Probably the point of this slide is to say, many of you might be coming from aerospace, used to aircraft or space vehicles. Uh, wind energy is no different. The same number of disciplines are all at play. The, the logistics and the cost modeling is very complex lots of different stakeholders. Unlike aerospace, we don't have a Boeing or Lockheed or Airbus that just is a prime contractor that owns the whole uh, value chain. This is all divided up piecemeal between different uh, industry players, which actually makes the problem uh, more difficult for a systems engineer. So wisdom is what it's trying to do is tackle that whole um, engineering chain and economics uh, balance sheet. We have all the same disciplines and we apply wonky uh, mathematics and optimization, so to do research and to geek out and that sort of thing. Um, so wisdom itself is divided up into a, a number of different components and groups. We kind of do it by, com um, say, component of the, so not MDO, open MDO component, but wind turbine component, like the rotor, the drivetrain, the turbine, uh, the tower, that sort of thing. 
So each of these blue boxes is, is a collection of OpenMDO components and groups all together. What we like to do is mix and match them, which is maybe where some of the differences lie compared to some of the other talks and presenters at this workshop. I was grepping and counting uh, you know, our, our code base, and I came up that we have over 140 different components, over 30 different groups uh, that, again, get mixed and matched uh, uh, depending on the, pr the problem we're trying to solve or what the project is. About 20% of our code is in some sort of compiled language. Um, this is maybe an underlying blade element momentum theory code or a, a beam element, uh, fi beam finite element code. Uh, just to make it quicker, uh, only 20 to 30% is analytical gradients. Maybe that's a little bit different from some of the other presentations. The number has been kept going down, not up. Something I'm not proud of, but uh, that's the way it is. Uh, so, and we. We've tried to architect our code so there's no implicit variables. It's just everything's an um, explicit component, 100% nonlinear solves, that sort of thing. We do conceptual design optimization. So each of these own blue boxes, there's a whole theory you know, presentation I could give. That's not the point here. Um, I think I made my key points here. So what I, where I'd like to go now is start to moving towards this topic of growing pains. So the first slide is growing successes. And it's going to get a little bit more um, critical as we move along. Uh, so first, I would say you know many thanks to the to the NASA Glenn team uh, and the the governing board of you know uh, University of Michigan and George Deck and all the other uh, core development team here um, that writing this type of software in Python, making it open source, really matches our charter as a national laboratory that we are providing resources to the community to the nation. Uh, to the wind industry, that sort of thing. Um, we also love our supercomputers as a DOE national lab. Every lab has their own supercomputer. So the fact that you know, OpenMDO has this in mind is, is good for us, but at the same time, when we engage industry, they don't have their clusters, they don't engage their clusters the same way that we engage ours. So being able to move between a parallel environment and a, and a single computer environment is very helpful. Um, so that's been great. Uh, OpenMDO has provided the glue code and optimization layer so we could focus on the modules. This actually has worked really well because our Department of Energy sponsors are very project focused, they're very deliverable focused. They said, okay, we need to go do the study on the tower or the rotor or the drivetrain. So we've been writing our uh, wisdom very piecemeal, kind of attacking at one component over time, um, going back again, like Justin was saying, to the version 0.x days. We've also brought in a lot of third-party black box software, you know, to kind of so we don't have to write some some piece of the code. Uh, we can just slap a, an OpenMDO component on top of that, and make it a lot easier. Um, but again, that's where some of the finite differencing comes in because usually some third-party code they're not as they're, they haven't gone to the made the pains of doing analytic uh, derivatives. Uh, the the team has been extremely responsive. A lot of people have mentioned that, whether direct emails or the Stack Exchange channel. That's been great. Helpful documentation, maybe, but just for more experienced users, I'll, I'll have another comment on that um, coming up. And again, it's, it's allowed us to connect with you guys as kind of the broader aerospace MDO community. In some ways, kind of feel like we're outside of that. We don't always go to the same conferences, always um, you know the same community you know, when we work in wind power. But again, it's all the same disciplines, a lot of the same problem. So uh, for the folks working on gradient-based optimization using high-fidelity models, OpenMDO is working very well. This, is, uh, uh, this comment came directly from the DTU guys in Denmark, uh, but there, it's true for the NRL people here, although um, not as many NRL people are using OpenMDO in, in, in that environment. Okay, so now um, some of the, you know, it would be nice if uh, comments. So onboarding new uh, contributors has been a little difficult. Uh, even for engineering PhDs that come to the National Lab, they say, you know what, this has a pretty steep learning curve. Our legacy code of that's Fortran-based and text-based input files, actually they find easier to use than, than OpenMDO and Wisdom. Some of that's our fault. Again, it's not, we're, we are a layer on top of OpenMDO, so some of that's the Wisdom team's fault. But we've gone to the extent of trying to create some graphical depictions of okay, here's what OpenMDO defines as a problem. It's, there's drivers and recorders and uh, models and groups and that sort of thing. Um, we created some Jupyter notebooks, that sort of thing, to, to uh, provide some of that initial onboarding and documentation. 
when we have new users that engage OpenML, you say, ah, the document, the documentation's okay. It's kind of inconsistent from one example to the next, what's being done. Once you get into it, the documentation is actually very helpful. You can search very easily, you know where you're going. Um, the onboarding has been a little slow, I would say. Okay, so, so again, we're gonna kind of uh, build up here. Uh, again, please, if you have comments, just shut them out. I understand that we're all getting ready for lunch, so um, feel free to interrupt me if you, if you have something to say. Uh, so in a modular framework, so this is maybe a little bit different than some of the other talks, this mix and match uh, approach that we like to do. Um, as we found from zero, from uh, OpenMDO version zero to one to two, there have been new rules about how different um, variables can be connected together. Uh, like Justin said, sometimes, uh, you know, when you add a new rule to find if you're doing something wrong, that's something you want to know, but you also need helpful ways to diagnose that. Um, we tend to mix and match analytical and finite difference differences in the same group. And when you kind of have that blend, it, sometimes it gets a little clunky. Uh, uh, helpful utilities and helpful architecture. So- Sorry, could you elaborate a little bit on that last point? Yeah, um, so there, uh, in this, uh, there's this like uh, use um, a prox totals or something like that, right? So does that kind of overwrite all your analytic gradients that you're using, right? Um, Sometimes people just use that instead of even a prox totals. A prox totals, yeah. So not not finite difference gradients of components, but group level finite difference. Right. When you have different ones in the same group, some people are just you know state what they want at the group level. Some people say what they want at the component level. We have different developers working on different things. When you mix a match, sometimes Once again, a prox totals is something that I told my developers people weren't using. So. <laughs> <laughs> We use it because sometimes like, oh, that's old code. I don't know if I trust those analytic gradients anymore. Somebody modified it. I don't know if they kept up with the derivatives. Let's just approximate everything. Uh, um, does that make sense? Uh, we could use a lot of, we could use some uh, utilities. We have, um, I think, thanks to actually Andrew, uh, we have a lot of in-house utilities for, okay, let's do a spline, but do it with gradients. Let's do interpolation with gradients, absolute value, that sort of thing. Um, I've noticed, OpenMDO adopted one of those, the Akama spline, but it made it into a component. Well, before it was just a single call in our, in our compute functions. And now, oh, all of a sudden, if we're gonna use it, we have to kind of break up our components at that point and max, uh, mix and match it and combine it in, at the group level. It kind of uh, mess with the architecture a little bit if we were gonna develop it. Uh, some comment from the DTU guys. There, there are lots of optimizers to choose from, but everybody has their favorite sports team that they like to root for. And <laughs> my sports team isn't in OpenMDO, what do I do? Um, so I'll, I have a suggestion on that coming up later too. Okay, so this is where I think the real uh, meat is of, of where our struggles have been is at the architecture and syntax level um, or changing of the API, I should, I should say. So the, maybe the first comment is similar to what Eric was saying, uh, OpenMDO, and its vision isn't just some helper library. It's going to help you invert a matrix uh, a little bit easier. It really is becomes the foundational architecture of your software model. Right? You have to change the way you think or you design your software if you're going to use <coughs> OpenMDO right. So with, since Wisdom adopted OpenMDO in the version 0.x days, we've struggled to um, uh, kind of progress to ver version 1.x and 2.x or whatever we're at now. So our, part of this is, again, our funding is very deliverable and project-based. There's no real uh, funding to say, okay, just do software maintenance and software improvement. Uh, so some of that's our fault and DOE's fault. But, you know, when you change the API, it's not just changing the syntax that you can do a find and replace. It really speaks to the, the true underlying mission and intended use cases of the code. Uh, it also stymies your open source uh, community because all of a sudden something they're developing, they can't just do a pull request because all of a sudden you've changed their API and like, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to mess with it anymore, right? Um, so we've flip-flopped quite a bit on our level of integration with OpenMDO. Do we see it as the lowest level integration, the backbone like Eric was talking about? Or do we just write a pure Python model and then just write some OpenMDO interface wrapper at the top level? We've gone back and forth. Um, depends actually who you're talking with. Uh, some developers uh, fall in one camp or the other. From the outside, um, from our point of view, OpenMDO does seem to be hardening on gradient-based optimization of high fidelity models. If that is a deliberate statement, if that's true, that's great, that, that's, a, that's an identified mission. 
again, that's not always our mission. Um, so in that sense, we kind of feel like OpenMDO needs to decide what it wants to be, and also more importantly, what it doesn't want to be. Um, I put up there an, an earlier marketing graphic that I don't think is on the website anymore, but something we still use uh, to explain uh, that shows you know, this middle ground that OpenMDO is, is taking out. And we feel like it's verging a little bit towards the high fidelity design optimization, that yellow area, and that's fine. Again, that's just maybe not where wisdom is. Uh, so we, we feel like we would want to know if that's where OpenMDO is going to go. Fine, maybe we might, for these purposes, head somewhere else and let those users uh, stay on OpenMDO. Okay, so a lot of our struggles um, with the, the API changes and changes in mission, um, they really, the stakes go up because we, we engage quite a bit with industry. <coughs> Again, NRL and DTU, uh, we engage our industry through the software that we write. We've both gone to both uh, institutions have gone to bat for OpenMDO saying this is the way to go. This is exactly, this meets our charter. We fought battles internally and externally that this is, this is the tool we want to use. But industry, they just want MATLAB level simplicity or elegance, or if they're using a commercial tool, they're paying for some help desk and support, right? So. If we train them up or say, this is the way your workflow should go and you're using wisdom um, on top of OpenMDO, and then the API changes and we have to go through a major rewrite, changes their workflow, um, that kind of resets their learning process to zero. They feel like time spent relearning a software is time wasted. And they also get the perception that our code isn't of a professional quality. We lose some face with that. And that's a really bad position with us. So we've, um, We've noticed some very slow adoption of wisdom within the wind industry community compared to all the other NREL uh, models that, I, that were there up in the beginning, open, fast, and forest, and this sort of stuff. And the learning curve and the way it changes is part of it. Not all that is OpenMDO's fault. A lot of that's on our software team too. Again, we're a bunch of engineers that sometimes pretend we're software developers, as is true with a lot of people in this room. Um, not everyone I know, uh, but that is a bad position for us. So I would say if there is a major redirection of OpenMDO code development, uh, if there says, okay, we're gonna embrace this high fidelity gradient based optimization, that's great. We just may go a different way and that's, that's okay. Um, I just, this is why we're in a workshop to, to hash this out. And an earlier version of this, uh, this workshop program, I think Justin, you had a, um, something that says to change the API or not to change, that's the question. I didn't see that on the agenda today. I'm still gonna talk about it. Okay. Just rolled it into my roadmap talk. So everybody was warming up their flamethrowers when they saw this though. <laughs> that, so, that was the point, that was the point. <laughs> right, so we're talking about flame bait, yeah. So that really- uh, I have my asbestos going <laughs> Right, uh, so I, I, yeah, yeah, I don't need to belabor that. Anyway, so uh, I'd say one last slide of maybe suggestions and then certainly open up to the, to the panel here, to the uh, group for, for other comments and discussion. Uh, maybe led by me, but maybe better led by Justin. Uh, so better supporting for mix and max uh, usage of components and groups. I put out one idea there. Oh, maybe we could connect two independent variables because sometimes one group is the master, sometimes the other one is the master, and it gets um, that gets exchanged quite a bit. I don't know if that's the right pathway in, in the software, but just one example of some things we're thinking about. Uh, better support for nested subproblems. Um, I know we were talking, I think uh, Professor Martins was saying, you know, the monolithic approach versus the distributor approach. We've, uh, there's a lot of people that um, have experience using, uh, in, in wind, using the distributor approach and really argue quite a bit that that's the way to go. Uh, lots of times the differences are when you have multiple models, taking a monolithic approach is great if you can, again, kind of write that, uh, um, that coupling problem and if all of them kind of execute on the same time frame, if one of those uh, modules uh, takes an order of magnitude longer to run than the other one, you kind of don't want to optimize the whole thing all the time. If you can isolate, say, that longer simulation time and run it as a nested subproblem, that works wonders. So that's where we would like some more support for that. Uh, we do a lot of mixed integer, we would like to do a lot of mixed mix integer optimization as a, as a conceptual design tool. Again, you know, if we're um, the frontier of wind is floating offshore wind. So, well, how many mooring lines should this thing have? That's a discrete variable, but that also depends on, um, that gives you dynamically sized arrays, which I know is a little clunky in, in OpenMDO. Um, 
uh, central support for other popular optimization libraries. Um, this kind of gets in, could there be a uh, plugin space versus GitHub pull requests as a way to keep user, um, user supplied code without having it to keep up with all the, uh, the uh, API rules, that sort of thing. Continued improvement of parallelization at all, at all scales, whether it's just single uh, computer, multiple cores, or multiple nodes. Um, I think OpenMDO is on the right path there, so just, I would say just keep it up. And also more helpful utilities for creating components with analytic gradients. Um, when you found that there's just a huge difference, a huge uh, burden. It's tough to train new engineers that are pretending to be software developers and discipline them to write analytic gradients. Um, I went through a lot of pain as a grad student doing implicit solvers in CFD, so I'm kind of used to it, but everybody else says, ah, forget it, I'm not doing that, I'm just going to find a difference. Um, I know, I think you guys are thinking about automatic differentiation. I know Python support isn't as good as, say, C++ or uh, Julia. Uh, lots of people want to move to Julia, and uh, that's something to think about. Um, so I think that's it for me for ranting and raving. Again, I'm trying to make it constructive, but also highlight some, some of the issues. Um, feel free to, you know, I'd like to open it up for the discussion. Can, can I get a show of hands? How many people have ever used P0, OpenMDO version zero? <laughs> All right, a fair <laughs> number, okay. Um, for those of you who haven't, a little bit of background is probably warranted here. Uh, the API change between version zero and version one was um, monumental, would be understating it a bit. Uh, I would say at the core, like the way you think about models hasn't changed all that much, but basically everything else changed. Um, the difference between V1 and V2 is much more subtle, more find and replace. Um, and so I, I would say explicitly all of the criticism in here I, I think I just 100% agree with. Um, the, anybody who had to do the upgrade from V0 to V1 really had to relearn everything. Um, and then we did it to you again with V1 to V2. I still argue that's more of a find and replace operation, but it's still a big change, right? So I don't anticipate anything quite like that happening again. When I originally wrote that to change or not to change thing, I, there are, it's more about API drift at this point, small changes, improvements, adding new features. Uh, however, I am actually legitimately curious to hear what you guys have to say about maybe new features are less important than stability at this point. Um, so, but I, I want to explicitly allow criticism. Like this is, this is exact, I'm, I'm fine with this. I think these are excellent points. Um, and if you guys hate the way we're developing right now in terms of like slowly drifting the API, you need to let us know. We'll have to make some adjustments. Maybe everybody's hungry. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> go sit down too. Yeah. <laughs> go ahead, Sandy. My background is kind of like working team marketer, so we we've been involved in that drift um, in some respects, but we also have problems that are both at the conceptual level, um, still in the continuous space, not the discrete space. So I'd be curious what kinds of what kinds of and, and, and in some respects, if, if that's happening from my perspective. So, uh, we, yeah, so like Justin said, the change from zero to one was monumental. And then the change from one to two was syntax based for the things that changed. But there also took a long time um, after, say, version 2.0. I think it wasn't until 2.7 or 2.8, where there were things that we were using in the 1.x code that couldn't find their way later. Uh, uh, just design variables that maybe aren't continuous and, you know, not design. Design variables are wrong, wrong word. Just general inputs or variables that are 
not a continuous numpy array. Um, so that talking about the discrete variables, right? So it used to be passed by object and then discrete, discrete variables. variables. Yeah. That took a long time to make it in there. At the same time, we saw a lot of um, new contributions in terms of surrogate modeling and that sort of thing. It kind of opened our eyes like, oh, you know, the OpenMDO team is developing this new next version, but a lot of their focus and energy is on okay, taking the high fidelity models that you have and then creating some, you know, doing something with it, whatever it is, surrogates or um, optimization. And some of the core functionality that we think is just automatic, um, uh, like discrete variables, was just kind of, it took a long time to make it in there. That's one example. I'm sure if I wasn't, if I took a minute, I could think of some others. Um, so we just recently, within the past six months, switched to version 2.0 because of, uh, of, of, that, of that change. Does that make sense? Let me, uh, let me, in the four minutes before lunch, let me address why that happened. Um, I, your perspective on it gives me a different, I see it differently. So I, I'm sure? seeing it from your side now, but uh, in version zero, we had this like pipe dream of adopting, I mean like literally Juan Alonzo was like, make CFD work inside a framework with optimization. And then he went back to Stanford, <laughs> right? And then they left somebody, me, completely unequipped and unskilled in the area to like solve that problem. So like stumble through at V0 and then V1 kind of through mod and that satellite problem that Keem showed, there was like a better way. Uh, and at some point it became apparent that that better way, there was no, we just had to cut, right? Um, and I knew it sucked and I knew it was gonna hurt, especially you guys, but I just couldn't find a way around it, which is why I didn't tell anybody I was doing it because I was <laughs> too afraid, I was, I was a wuss, right? So. Um, but then we got to a point with V1 where I thought it was working pretty well, especially for the low scale stuff, the lower order yeah, stuff like you was, guys are using. Yeah. And I was happy with it, but I actually started doing my thesis research. And when I started to pull the high fidelity stuff in there, I could get it to work, but it wasn't as efficient as it should be. And so I took a step back and I realized that the changes I was going to need to make to make it work for high fidelity would break all the low fidelity stuff. So V2 was really, so V1, like I think of V0 as us figuring out kind of like a serial componentized philosophy. And then V1 is making that work into like a more effective piece of software. So V1 was serial. And then V2 was really parallelization. But then as soon as we wrote that, I knew it wasn't going to work for, so we like spent a lot of time like backfilling and getting the performance back. Mm -hmm. So my thinking was, admitted, this is not an excuse, this is just so you guys know what my thinking was. Well, the pe folks who need V1 can stay with V1, it's, it's functional. Mm -hmm. And we needed like more technology development for V2. Secondarily to that, because we didn't establish a very good community discussion pathway channel for communication, I wasn't sure what needed to come in. And we adopted a, I'm not gonna add a feature until somebody is going to use it. And so until somebody asked for it, somebody who I believed was actually going to use it, because people ask for stuff all the time. Um, I just wasn't, wasn't gonna spend development effort on it. So I think the combination of those two things of me thinking, well, V1 is good enough for folks who are doing low order stuff, let me figure out. And it was, it was a lot of work to get like, I would say the fundamental challenge that V2 tackled was figuring out how to take the ideas that came out of all the MDO people for gradient-based methods that worked in the large scale and make them work at a low scale. So I don't think that we're only focused on high order stuff. In fact, the stuff Eric presented is so low order that Chris told us it's not good enough, <laughs> uh, right? He wants, us, he wants us to push up not to CFD, but right, like we need to, but that's when you have this spectrum of like hundreds and hundreds of low order codes and then like two high order codes, mm -hmm. the framework has to support that spectrum right. efficiently. So I only, really only like I'd say the last year have we gotten to the point where I felt like it was at the like low levels of the framework like that we've conquered that. Um, that being said, we will actively develop features that we know people are going to use. Um, and, and you guys, uh, I was gonna, I'm gonna, I'll mention this again, but I'm, I'm pretty sure Andrew Ning holds the record and hopefully he will always hold the record, sorry Andrew, for most bugs discovered in OpenMDAO. Um, <laughs> you guys have suffered a lot particularly. So the heavy users of OpenMDAO are important to us. We derive value from that. And uh, as long as I know what you guys need and if I know that something is holding you up, we can work on it. Okay. But, yeah. But, sure. but I do not think that we are exclusively focusing on high fidelity. Although, like Sandy said, we may be drifting in that direction. 
In which case, that's, that's kind of what this workshop is supposed to kickstart a fix for.